Welcome to the Circling the Bases podcast. I'm Connor Rogers alongside DJ Short and Scott Pianowski. And fellas, it's a big one today. We got the outfielder preview. This one's going to take a while. The rankings are going to be longer. There are a lot more storylines on the transaction wire as well. But big picture here, DJ, what is the one thing that sticks out to you with this group that every year is loaded with superstars? I think it's top heavy this year. I've found myself, I've done a million mocks just to help you guys out. And what I'll say is when I get into the late rounds, I'm a little uncertain. So for me, I'm this year of all years, I'm willing to dive in a little bit earlier than maybe I, I am in the past where maybe you see some more one-dimensional type of players later. I'm going to be more aggressive on outfielders this year. Scott, totally, would you, totally agree would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, Outfield usually is a spot where it's like, oh, I can get a good outfielder in the middle of the draft. I can get a good outfield at the end of the draft. And I think when the DH came universally, I thought, oh, great, more good offensive players are going to have access to the lineup. But what we're seeing is sometimes that's like the catcher gets shuttled there, the first baseman gets shuttled there, and teams have the platoon is making a comeback. The Giants love to platoon. Tampa Bay wants a different lineup 162 times a year, it feels like. <laughs> So e even in Yahoo standard leagues where four outfielders are the requirement, not five, I would not just say, oh, I'll just get a good outfielder whenever I want, last round, free agent wire. I mean, of course, you're always going to be playing the wire in that. But I think take take outfielder just a little bit more seriously than you used to. It used to be early in my drafts. If I if I had an outfielder and infielder who I liked about the same, I think, well, infield's more shallow, outfield's deep, I'll default to the infielder. I don't feel that way anymore. Before we get into the biggest transactions, a reminder, every season is draft season. Get your Roto World Draft Guide bundle today and dominate your football, baseball, and basketball drafts packed with profiles, rankings, projections. Order today and get all three Roto World Draft Guides for the price of two. Plus, use promo code BUNDLE5 and save an extra $5 at checkout. Fellas, every year on the free agent market in baseball, we see massive contracts handed out to the outfield group. And, of course, no surprise after the season that Aaron Judge had, yep. a fantasy he superstar, is. the he cover is. athlete. Cover boy, yep. Yeah, the well, well-earned cover athlete of the yep. Roto World Fantasy Baseball Guide right here. Resigns with the Yankees for nine years, $360 million. There was some drama yep. with this signing, but ultimately ends up back with the Yankees. DJ, do you think that's the best situation for Judge to – Matching last year is just insane. I don't think anyone's right. expecting that, right. but to be the star that he is. Yeah, I mean, when there were the rumors of him going to San Francisco, potentially from a fantasy perspective, you're like, no, <laughs> you know, yes, exactly. don't, don't do that. Stay where you, you know, stay where you are most successful. And ultimately, the Yankees met the price that he wanted, and he stayed in New York. And I think all is well. Uh, like you said, I don't think we're expecting 62 home runs again, but we know he has elite uh, contact quality. He's going to hit for massive power when he's healthy. Uh, so no worries there. Scott, would you agree on the judge front that this was the best for him and, of course, everybody playing fantasy, drafting or keeping, stashing judge for the long term? For sure. Ent entering an age 31 season, this is like like so many big contracts in the middle of a player's career. We don't know how the contract will age, but I don't think anybody cares in season one. And a lot of times we talk about, I've said on some of the other pods, just how nervous you get. A player changes teams, he changes leagues. Aaron Judge doesn't change anything. Same park, same uniform number, same home run friendly park, of course. I think he's currently going number three in ADP in the outfield. I think he could be the first outfielder off the board in a lot of leagues. And if I were picking an outfielder first, I think Judge would be the guy I would lean towards. Even though I know you don't get stolen bases from him, but he's just going to be dominant in four other categories. Yep. Two trades here, guys. One we discussed on the catcher preview. The Blue Jays acquired Dalton Varshow from the Diamondbacks. Gabriel Moreno and Lourdes Gurriel go back to Arizona in that one. Another one that's a big one, though, and this was very early in the offseason, the Mariners acquire Teoscar Hernandez from the Blue Jays. Yeah, I love that move. And, and, you know, on the surface, maybe you're like, that's not the best situation to, you know, switch from Toronto to Seattle. But Teoscar Hernandez's power plays anywhere. His quality of contact is off the charts. So I still think he's going to put up big-time power numbers in that Mariners lineup. And I think an underrated Mariners lineup. Scott, would you agree that this is not a bad landing spot for him, especially joins the lineup with the J-Rod show over there in Seattle? Yeah, it's a, it's a ballpark drop, but he's going to be well insulated by the players around him. And he was a first-round return two years ago. I think yep. people forget what the ceiling is for Hernandez. And Seattle has become a team where we think about, like, when Tampa Bay makes a move, oh, they're probably right. I, Tampa Bay's uh, – Seattle's been right with a lot of their moves lately to the point that I'm willing to backline them. You know, if they're at the craps table, I'd just be betting what the Mariners are betting on. I think Seattle Hernandez is going to have a big season. Scott, we'll start with you on this one. This is, these are always the mystery signings. As much coverage as 
you know, obviously other leagues get, but the Red Sox signing Masataka Yoshida for five years, $90 million, pretty significant number for a guy that had a lot of power, but is a smaller player. Do you think it translates over here in America? I like it. I, I'm a little bit concerned with, we saw what Seiya Suzuki got last year where they, there was every borderline pitch I feel like was called against him. And so he was almost treated like a rookie, even though he had plenty of professional experience. The Red Sox are getting a lot of guff these days for how the organization and how the ownership is running the team because they don't want to throw money around. They eventually, I think they felt pressured to do that Devers extension. They really blew it with Xander Bogarts and that whole thing. We know the Mookie Betts trade was a mess a few years ago and they just didn't get a lot back. Although Alex Verdugo is not a bad player, but they're still pretty smart. I think Bloom is a pretty smart GM when it comes to playing the market. And Shishida wasn't cheap, of course, the posting fee and the big contract, but probably going to bat lead off. Boston, Fenway, it's a great offensive park, not a great home run park, but there's almost no foul territory. There's a really good batting eye. It always helps offense to be involved there. I don't think the Red Sox one to nine have a great lineup, but maybe one to five, one to six, it's still above average. I think you see Yoshida is set up to at least meet his ADP and maybe be a profit player in his first season. Our last one here, DJ, from the big moves, the big money moves. The Mets re-signed Brandon Nimmo. Eight-year deal. Yeah. Eight-year deal, $162 million. We know Steve Cohen's probably at the point where I don't care about the last couple of years of the deal. Yeah. I care about trying to win my first World Series yeah. right now. Nimmo's such an interesting player because gets on base a ton, bat to ball ability, yeah. some pop here and there. No stolen base for a yeah. guy with great sprint speed. How exactly. Do you, how do you evaluate a player like that? Yeah, I think coming off the contract, he might be a little bit overvalued in fantasy. I mean, that's just the way it is as far as brand names are concerned. But you're right. I mean, I don't think he brings that fantasy juice you're really looking for. Can he be a third outfielder on a mixed league roster? Sure. But I don't think the ceiling is all that high. A couple of smaller moves here, and I'll let you guys pick your poison of which one stands out to you. The Angels acquired Hunter Renfro from the Brewers. The Brewers acquired Jesse Winker uh, in a Colton Wong deal with the Mariners. Cody Bellinger was non-tendered by the Dodgers. Everybody looking for that Cody Bellinger. Maybe not bounce back to form, but bounce back in any way. He signs <laughs> with the Cubs. Mitch Haniger and Michael Conforto, two guys that have struggled to stay healthy. Conforto didn't even play last year with yeah. the shoulder both signed with the Giants. Which one of these is more notable? Uh, I think Renfro, uh, just from a fantasy perspective. I may talk about him a little bit later as well, but I think he's one of the more underrated, consistent power hitters in baseball. I like how the Angels have built some depth into that lineup, and Renfro's going to be right there after you know Otani and Mike Trout. I mean, that's a great place to be. Scott, what about you out of all of those more, not minor transactions, but definitely Tier 2 moves? Yeah, I think Winker getting away from Seattle and getting to a park in Milwaukee that not only favors power, but favors left-handed power, probably play every day. I mean, you know, he's going to hit 220 against lefties. I can live with that. I think he has a bounce back year. A little bit disappointed that the Giants took Conforto and took Mitch Haniger because they're two guys I was looking to buy on a bounce back, but they just go to such a difficult place to hit. I'd probably favor Haniger if you wanted one of those two guys, but not sure what to expect. And I agree with DJ's endorsement of Hunter Renfro. Not only is he probably the cheapest 30 home runs you can find, but he's also a slot receiver for the Raiders. So, I mean, you get that. You get all sorts of position eligibility here. <laughs> Multi sport keeper right there and Hunter Renfro. <laughs> Two position changes, and these are big names. They are really, really big names. Fernando Tatis Jr. likely to play the outfield with Xander Bogart's arrival there on that monster deal. And then Jazz Chisholm moving to center field with the Luis Arise trade. I mean, obviously these guys are going to be viewed as still stars, of course. Yeah. But how does the position, I would think, versatility in fantasy play into this? Yeah, I mean – Maybe this year it's a question where you might want to put Chisholm and, and Tatis into your lineup. I think probably chances are you will still use Chisholm at second base because second base tends to be a shallow position. Tatis at shortstop, but it's always nice to have those options, especially because the waiver wire is there, injuries happen, so multi-position eligibility is huge. Scott, would you agree? I know versatility is just massive in this market. No, I think DJ's right with Chisholm. I mean, the second base is such a skanky position. I, I talked about outfield depth maybe being down a little bit, but second base is such an ugly position that you would play Chisholm there. But who knows? Maybe you luck into another good second baseman, and it, it never hurts to have some flexibility. What I'm curious about is right now Chisholm looks like their third-place hitter. 
And how much is he going to run? I mean, usually when you think of somebody who's going to run a lot, number one hitter, number two hitter, even the guys at the bottom of the lineup run. I know the bases are wider this year, and we're expecting with the pickoff rules changing, with the pitch clock coming in, we're expecting a more run-friendly Major League Baseball. So, and Chisholm, of course, in his 20s, you want to get your stolen bases from your younger players. I'm just curious at what point you know, he had some injury problems last year. Does he decide maybe let's focus on the offense, let's focus on the defense, let's focus on staying on the field, but but still, in a Miami lineup, I'm not really eager to get invested in. He's the one guy who stands out. You to know, me. that's a great point about Chisholm playing center field. How mm. how energetic is he going to be out there, and does that add to the injury risk like we saw last season? I think that could happen. Two massive injury news, especially the first one here. And Bryce Harper coming off the Tommy John surgery. He's likely out until around midseason. And then the other one, Starling Marte, is just a giant question mark coming off the core muscle surgery. No, the Mets don't even know. I mean, Buck Showalter doesn't even know if he'll be ready, full go out of the season. How long will it take for him to get up to speed in sp in, during spring training, if at all? Let's start with Bryce Harper here, DJ. Yeah. What do you think this does to him in, in drafts? Because right. that's a long – by the time he comes back, you could potentially be out of it in your season. I mean, that's a great point. And, and I think it's going to vary from league to league um, who's willing to take the risk. But – Let's say he comes back in July. That's like getting a first-round pick added yeah. to your roster. So at a certain point, I think it becomes, especially if you need power or if you're in an on-base percentage league, you're going to jump maybe a little bit earlier. Or maybe you just don't have as many home runs as you were hoping to get going into your draft. It becomes more feasible. But I really think from league to league, it's going to vary widely. Scott, do you think this opens the door to maybe get some value out of Harper and Marte if they just fall down the boards? Or do you think they're just too big of household names that that won't happen? Yeah, you know, I always say that it's no fun to play fantasy sports like an actuary, but I, I have to do it with Harper. He's going to miss half the season. How healthy is Does he come back and hit the ground running or is there an adjustment period? Do they not even play him every day because they don't want to overextend him? You know, maybe the maybe the Phillies are seven games up in the in the NL West uh, NL, NL West and at least at that point and they think okay Bryce just you know play four days a week play five days a week yeah he's we know saw last year they didn't even want him to play defense anymore they just wanted him to hit because he wasn't healthy I'm not going to be the injury optimist in my league now if I'm in a league where nobody wants to touch Harper fine I'll pick him up I'll stash him on IL which you know is part of the Yahoo fantasy game and all that I get it but I'm not going to be the most optimistic person on his return and in the case of Marte. We need stolen bases to be a part of his game, and he's yep. into his 30s now. You just wonder that at what point, and I know a couple of years ago, you know, with Oakland, it felt like he stole a base every game, but he's at a dangerous cliff in his career where at some point he could just decide it's not worth it, and he has like an eight stolen base season. There's two players. It's no, it's no fun to not draft, draft Bryce Harper. It's no fun to not draft like Bryce, uh, Mike Trout. You know, We don't know what to do with him. He would be a second-round pick this year. Wouldn't we ever said that before? But Harper's probably on my fade list this season. And the other thing about stashing a player like Harper for half the season, it's like like you were saying, you might be done by the time he's ready to go and you're dropping players who are hurt also to leave mm -hmm. room for Harper to return in midseason. It can be complicated, so maybe you don't want to add that to your palette. You know? Yeah, if that happens, I you like better to say, be ready I to like to say, I like to say don't draft into injuries because injuries are going to find you. Okay, yeah. You don't have to go out finding them. That's, that's really sound advice. Let's get into – you mentioned fading. Let's get into some fades here. DJ, we'll start with you. A couple different outfielders that you just think their average draft position has gotten out of control. So I, I, I hate to say this, but uh, Michael Harris the second for me. I mean, I look at the ADP right now on NFC. It's 28.25. So, you know, in a deeper mix, league, you're looking at a second-round pick for someone who hasn't played a full season yet. I think it's just a little too much for me. And looking at what Harris did last year, he was, he was great. He – 19 homers, 20 steals in 114 games. But the, the approach is a concern for me. Uh, struck out 24.3% of the time last year. Walked just 4.8% of the time. Had one of the highest chase rates in the league as well. Is there going to be an adjustment period for him at some point? To, does the league start to figure him out a bit more? Not saying he can't adjust again, but is he going to return that second round value? I'm, I just want to see it before I pay for it. Yeah, Scott, do you have the same concerns with Michael Harris and who are a couple of guys that you're fading as well? Yeah, I, I do think the market's a little bit over the skis on Harris. Just he did more than expected last year and just regression seems like it could be the path for him this season. And the ADP is expecting him to at least maintain what he did, if not get better. I'm always going to be nervous about a play, player like that. 
I talked about the actuary theme with fantasy. I, Giancarlo Stanton, he's a he's a show. When he hits a home run, he hits at 520 feet, it feels like. But how many games are you getting? He Batting average is not guaranteed. He's not going to run much. I don't even think the Yankees are even expecting a full season from him anymore. You're getting like 115 games. So I'm nervous to touch him. And Byron Buxton, I know the best of Byron Buxton. You think, oh, he could be an MVP candidate. Gold Glover in center field, power and speed. He shut down the running game. He doesn't want to run anymore. He still has a lot of swing and miss in his game and i just don't be i'm not confident he can stay on the field you know maybe they need to tell him maybe they need to move him off into a corner outfield and say look don't don't take on the the right field wall don't, don't die for everything you know we need you in october we don't need to, you know, to lose you you know we remember to think about him and as hurting himself in the spring training game i just feel like buxton has an all-out style of play and i love it as a fan it makes me nervous as a fantasy manager and that's the way that I feel about Chisholm and Tatis as well, potentially playing center field. That's the way they play, which makes them exciting to watch, but it can also be a risk. And I'm with you on Buxton, Stanton. You don't want to pay into the injury. With, with Buxton, he played 92 games last year. It was his most since 2017. I mean, you are just expecting him to miss time at this point. So why would you invest a top 100 pick in him? I, I wouldn't do that. Stanton, I feel the same way. Mitch Hanniger, an injury risk going to San Francisco as well. The names I'm fading at this point when we get to those mid to late round type of outfielders, players who have this injury history, I'm just not going to buy in on that. Yeah, that's been a consistent theme on this show, and I don't blame you guys at all. Let's get on track, though, a little more positive. A couple guys that you like their ADP right now, DJ, and you're buying in on. Yeah, so Taylor Ward uh, with the Angels. Actually, I like Hunter Renfro, too. So two Angels outfielders here. Taylor Ward uh, was an early season waiver wire sensation uh, last year. Really cooled off starting in the end of May, which coincided with an outfield collision uh, there. So had a really strong finish to the season, which for me was really encouraging to see him bounce back. The quality of contact is there. There's patience. He doesn't strike out a lot. There's also some untapped speed upside. I like him a lot at his current ADP, 128.55 on NFC. Scott, what about you? Who are you buying in on? Yeah, I think Kyle Schwarber is they finally found what he's supposed to be. Don't care about his off uh, about his defense and just let him sit at the top of a lineup, let him hit home runs, let him walk, score a hundred times, he even stole bases last year. Yeah. Um, just realizing, look, if they're gonna not take me seriously as a base runner, I'm gonna take second base. And even without Bryce Harper for probably half the season, a very deep Philadelphia lineup that's just added Trey Turner. I think Kyle Schwarber's gonna score 115 runs, hit 35 home runs, even the RBIs. It no longer you think about in past seasons, the leadoff hitter for the National League just couldn't drive in that many runs because the pitcher spot would kill the flow of the offense. That's not the case anymore with Universal DH. I think Schwarber's priced for a nice profit. And, and Sia Suzuki I mentioned earlier, last year, every borderline pitch they called him out on. He's gotten used to American baseball. He's gotten used to the culture. I think he made really good adjustments last year. Didn't maybe have the season we expected. Remember, he was a better offensive player in Japan than, than um, Mount, whom I think of, Shohei Otani. He was a better player than Shohei Otani, at, at offensively speaking. I think Suzuki has a big step up in his second season. The Cubs are no longer a destination fantasy offense for us. I think you're getting him at a round or two discount. I think there's plenty of room for profit. There was a lot of hype with him last season. Now he's kind of post-hype, which always makes for a, a good target. I'll say Lars Newtbar with the Cardinals mm. here. Got off to a bit of a slow start against MLB pitching last season, but hit 255, 12 homers. 870, 887 OPS over his final 73 games. Also posted a 373 on base percentage. Could very well find him as the Cardinals leadoff man this season. We were just talking a bit earlier about, or in the catcher episode, about the depth of this Cardinals lineup, the veteran quality that's there. So for him batting leadoff in this lineup potentially, I view him as like kind of a cheaper Brandon Nimmo that you can get a round or two later and you'll see similar fantasy stats, maybe even better from Newbar. As yeah, we already brought up, oh, ahead, brought up Nimmo. He was going to be one of my fades. And uh, it was DJ being a big Betts fan. I thought maybe I was risking it going into the corners. I might get elbowed. But remember, lineup construction is a huge part of what we're tracking in the spring. We talked about in the middle infield portion of the show how we were nervous about Tommy Edmond. Will he bat lead off in St. Louis? They have options there. And Newt Bar can easily take that spot. Give you one more target to get. Jake McCarthy uh, came out, kind of came out of nowhere. A, a little bit old to be a prospect, but he showed a little bit of power. Really good speed. Probably going to bat third on an Arizona team. I know we don't pay attention a lot for fantasy, and even when you do, maybe you're looking at somebody like Corbin Carroll, who's a really exciting young player. But 
I believe in what McCarthy did last year. I think it's sustainable. Again, not a ton of home runs coming, but he might steal 30 bases. I think he hits for a plus average. And because he's shielded by a team that isn't going to be a contender, I think you get him at a very friendly ADP this spring. One more target for me. Who was watching the Marlins last September? No one, obviously. So Brian De La Cruz is You're a Mets fan. You've seen him a couple times. That's about it. Uh, But Brian De La Cruz uh, came over from the Astros, a former prospect there. But uh, he came back in September last year, and his numbers were ridiculous. Hit 388, six home runs, 1.137 OPS over his final 25 games. Yeah, maybe that's a little bit fluky. But look, if you go to his baseball savant page, it's lighting up red. You see 86th percentile in hard hit percentage, 84th percentile barrel percentage, 82nd percentile average exit velocity. I'm like, whoa, you know, maybe there's something here. And you look at his ADP, 236.16 on, on NFC. He's basically a late round flyer. Maybe you take, maybe he can be that breakout guy. As we always do, we go through some late round flyers, some darts to throw, always with more younger players up and coming, uh, different pro- some guys that are still in farm systems. A couple I'll read off to you guys and you make your pick here. Esther Ruiz from The Athletics, 24 years old, really looking for speed, DJ, is what you have said. That yep. would be a guy. Jordan Walker, we know all the hype around Jordan Walker with the Cardinals. He's still 20 years. He will start the season as a 20-year-old player. We talked about him in the third base episode. Could win their starting right field job. Garrett Mitchell on the Brewers. 24 years old, and then Oscar Colas uh, on the White Sox, 24, 24 years old, could win their starting right field job. Who is intriguing to you out of that list? I mean, it depends on what I need late in the draft, but Ruiz, to me, stands out. I mean, Oakland is a rebuilding team. They're going to give him a chance yeah. to play. They may bat him near the top of the lineup. And if you look at what he did last year, I think the home runs were inflated by the environment that he played in in the minors in the Pacific Coast League, but – he stole 85 bases in 114 games in, in AAA last year in the minors. That is insane. And the speed is legit. The power we can question, but the speed is legit. And with this stolen base environment that we expect, and the A's probably going to be desperate for offense, they may just let him run like crazy. If he can keep everyday playing time, he could be a huge find. Scott, who's your late round dart throw here? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's fun when we say the same guy, but I got to go Ruiz too. I, I dare our li- dear listeners to try to name this Oakland lineup one through nine. It is a ghost town. And a lot of times when we're looking for stolen bases, we want a team maybe that isn't contending that has that YOLO approach on offense. Go ahead, run as much as you want. We need something to sell. We know Oakland isn't always the greatest place to hit. There's tons of foul territory. You ever been to a game in Oakland? The game's like a rumor because it's so far away from the stands. So I think Ruiz is going to be able to run as much as he wants. I think he percolates the top of this lineup really quick and becomes a player that they actually try to market because they don't really have much else going on with this current team all right our prospects are stash list time Sal Freelich on the Brewers 22 years old Joey Weimer on the Brewers Colton Kowser on the Orioles Alec Burleson on the Cardinals George Valera on the Guardians Andy Pages on the in the Dodgers system definitely a crowded place to find a role and then Sedan Raffaella on the Red Sox DJ we know these a lot of these guys won't even get the chance out of spring, but could make an appearance some point during the season. Yeah, I, I like Sal Frelick in, in real fantasy uh, or real baseball terms. He, he gets on base. He makes contact. If he gets into the, the Brewers lineup at some point, maybe he hits near the top first or second. He could be a factor in mixed leagues. I like Sedan Rafaela. Let's just say the middle infield for the Red Sox is a complete disaster this season, which I think it could be. He's getting some time in center field right now. There's questions in center field for the Red Sox as well. I think there's multiple avenues to getting potential playing time there. Put up really good numbers in the minors last year, kind of a pop-up prospect. Uh, I think he could be worth a stash at some point. Scott, anyone on this list that you think could make some kind of impact, even if it's later over the summer? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to squeeze Walker in, who we mentioned earlier. Who who knows? Maybe he could break camp with the Cardinals, but I see him more as a midseason call-up and somebody who could be in the middle of a really good lineup in the middle of the pennant race. I think he's a great idea for the second half. All right, one more reminder. Download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It's available in your app store today. Outfielder rankings, a star-studded group, it seems like, year after year, and a beast to take on as we have top 20s from both DJ and Scott. DJ, we will go 20 to 11 out of the gate. 
where are you starting off? So number 20 for me is Hayoscar hey Hernandez. Already went over my case for him going to Seattle. Not really concerned about the ballpark change. I still think he's going to be very valuable. 19, I have Brian Reynolds on the Pirates for now. Maybe not for much longer, of course, requested a trade. If he's traded at some point, will probably be to a contender, will probably be to a better lineup, maybe a better ballpark. So top 20 outfielder for me, I have him at 19. 18, I have Adolis Garcia. And with Garcia, he was a player we were avoiding in drafts last year, but he backed up his breakout season, improved his strikeout rate as well. I still think there's reason for optimism there. 17, I have Eloy Jimenez, and I think there's a monster season in there somewhere if he could just stay healthy. So I'm willing to take the risk there. Uh, 16, I have Corbin Carroll, very exciting prospect with the Diamondbacks. Quality of contact wasn't overly impressive in what we saw from him last year in the majors, but he is one of the fastest players in baseball. Excited to see what he can do. 15, I have Dalton Varsho. Uh, I think you're more likely to use him at the catcher position in fantasy leagues, but he still makes by top 20 outfielders. 14, I have Michael Harris the second. I'm fading on ADP, but I still think he could be a top 20 outfielder. And of course, I could be wrong, and the upside is there. 13, I have Kyle Schwarber leading off. For the Phillies, big time power. I like him just like Scott does. 12, Cedric Mullins. I think we've already seen his fantasy peak there in Baltimore with the changes that they made in the ballpark, but I think a well-rounded fantasy outfielder for sure. Uh, and 11, Luis Robert. I think, it, again, sort of like with Jimenez, if he could just stay healthy, I think he could be a first-round pick quality player. Scott, who does your top 20 start with? Yeah, a lot of the same names. Uh, apologies to Teoscar Hernandez, who did not make my top 20 list, but I think DJ is right that he's going to have a big season. Like, say, a Suzuki in the top 20, second year in America. You know, sophomore year was my best year in college. I think the second year for Suzuki is going to include a spike when the umpires stop calling him out on every borderline pitch. Brian Reynolds, 19. As DJ mentioned, he'll start in Pittsburgh, probably won't end up there, and he's a very broad base of skills, which is often makes a player underrated in real life or in fantasy. Corbin Carroll is my number 18 outfielder, although I think Jake McCarthy for ADP may be the Arizona outfielder I gravitate towards, but obviously Carroll, a young player with a wonderful set of skills and is going to be coveted in most fantasy leagues. Adolis Garcia at 17 is swing and miss in this game. He's going to strike out a lot. He may not have a great OBP, but if you're in a standard five by five league, you're going to get plenty of category juice. I think smart leagues are going to discount him and you can swoop in and get a nice deal on Garcia. Eloy Jimenez, as DJ talked about Chicago, everything went wrong last year with injuries. If Jimenez is healthy, he could be an MVP candidate. It's the cheapest you may get him in the next five seasons. Let's try to get some of them. And I have Robert right next to him at 15. It's really the same story. You just need these guys to be healthy. And Chicago could be looking at a top five offense. Cedric Mullins may not hit all kinds of pitching, but the Orioles will play him all the time. They'll let him run liberally. He'll probably hit about 15 home runs. He's never going to get back to that peak season we saw a couple of years ago, but still a player who fills three or four categories and somebody I like in an ascending Baltimore lineup. Kyle Schwarber, 13, perfect modern leadoff hitter. And he's even stealing bases now. He'll get on base. He'll knock 35 out of the park. Really good lineup buoyancy, even without Bryce Harper for half the season. I want to get some shares of the Phillies. Randy Rosarena, number 12, he's power and speed, right? He's not going to go in the elite class of outfielders, but he's the one Ray you kind of know is in the lineup day in, day out. You're going to get 25 home runs, probably 15 stolen bases. I'll say yes to that. Dalton Varsho is going to change teams, going to change leagues. That's always a challenge, but the Toronto Park is going to help him out. The players around him are going to help him out as well. You'll probably use him as catcher, as DJ talked about. I do have Michael Harris at 10, but let me say I'm not going to draft him there. I think DJ outlined the underscoring the problems with Harris that he could be a dangerous player in his uh, in his second season. So he's something I'm a little bit nervous about, but I still kept him in a lofty fantasy rank. Moving into those top 10 rankings this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. DJ, we'll go 10 to 6 here. Where do you start? So I am I have Randy Rosarena at 10, so just a little bit higher than Scott. And what I like from Rosarena last year was that he improved his strikeout rate. So I don't think he's quite the batting average risk that maybe he looks like. And you get that well-rounded counting stats there. So I'm a fan of Rosarena for sure. Mike Trout at number 9. Can you believe that? In fantasy outfielders. But, the, I mean – has the injury concerns, doesn't run. He's stolen four bases over the past three seasons combined. So, you know, change. when you're looking at these top fantasy outfielders, most of them are going to steal bases. Jordan Alvarez is the exception, but that's what you're looking for from a top fantasy outfielder. Trout's just not doing that these days. Uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. I have at number eight here. 
A lot of NAs there because he did not play last season, was hurt, had the PED suspension, coming off a of shoulder surgery as well. So what are we going to see from him this year? Who knows? But the upside is through the roof. I, I have a number eight here. He could, he could very well be number one by the end of the season. Uh, number seven, Mookie Betts, leading off there for the Dodgers. Maybe not the player he once was fantasy-wise, but he's going to get on base atop a good lineup. We'll give you power, a little bit of speed as well. Uh, I think he's a safe play. Uh, six, Jordan Alvarez. I think he could be the MVP this season. Uh, his expected batting average was actually higher than 306 last year, and the contact that he makes is just ridiculous. Uh, quality of contact is, is insane. So I think he could hit 40 home runs. He could hit for a higher batting average. He could win a batting title this year, so I'm a huge fan of Alvarez as well. Scott, you mentioned your top 10 kicks off with Michael Harris, but where does it go from there? Yeah, I, I ran through the stop line on that. I apologize, but Harris is my 10. Michael Trout, number nine, he's on the backside of his career. It's a Hall of Fame career. It's maybe a Mount Rushmore career, but not going to run anymore, and I don't think he's going to play anywhere close to 150 games, so I'm probably not going to draft into Trout. Maybe I'll regret that. What do we get from Fernando Tatis after missing a full season? That's why he's my outfielder eight, but as DJ mentioned, I mean, he could be on all the magazine covers next year in a deep San Diego lineup, which includes Juan Soto, my number seven outfielder, coming off a down season, but maybe the trade rumors played with him a little bit. San Diego is not quite as bad of a park as it used to be. They've made some cosmetic changes and some infrastructure changes. The ball flies a little bit better there now. So don't let the park cheat you out of Juan Soto. I have Mookie Betts at six just because of the floor. When does Mookie Betts ever let you down? He's in a really strong lineup. He will run some. He still has power. He's going to hit for a plus average. He's not electric maybe in any category, although he'll probably lead the league in runs scored. And I think that actually makes him a little bit underrated Jordan Alvarez left-handed hitter now there's no shift anymore this guy it's just so crazy that he hits over 300 he was unlucky by the stat cast metrics yeah. as DJ was talking about you want any piece you can get in this Houston lineup and, and that means Jordan Alvarez I think is a legitimate first rounder all right, finally, DJ, five to one. Take us home here with the best outfielders in your projections for fantasy baseball. Yeah, so I have Juan Soto at five. And when I look at what he did last year, I think he was pressing a little bit when he started the year with the Nationals and a lineup that was basically blown apart. Then he goes to San Diego, deals with a little bit of a back issue. I wonder how much that was a factor in what we saw down the stretch. Also hit a ton of infield fly balls, which is kind of unlike what Juan Soto usually does. I think we see a bounce back there with him this year in a lineup that should be a ton of fun. I have Kyle Tucker here at number four. For me, it was a little bit disappointing last year, but still piled up the counting stats. I like the Astros lineup. Hopefully he's in a prominent spot there. You never know with Dusty Baker what he might decide. But I, I think across the board, very valuable, makes a ton of contact too. There's probably some batting average upside we haven't seen there quite yet from Tucker. Uh, number three, I have Ronald Acuna Jr. Coming off that ACL surgery last year, just kind of a little bit of a downturn in everything. Quality of contact, sprint speed, but you have to think a year removed from that surgery, we see him bounce back, be a little bit more of the Acuna that we're accustomed to. Number two, the fast riser, Julio Rodriguez here. I mean, just think of what he could do over a full season. We basically got three quarters of a season out of him last year, but a full 162, like if he doesn't go 30-30 this year, it's going to be a disappointment. He also probably won't match his ADP if he doesn't, so that's something to keep in mind. Aaron Judge, I have number one here, and the reason for that is just the power advantage that he gives you. Yes, hit 62 home runs last year. That was 16 more than the next closest player. So for me, just the advantage that he gives you there in a hitter-friendly ballpark, like he scored 133 runs. Can, can he do that again? Probably not, but I think when you're talking about floor, Judge is a pretty good one. Scott, excited to see where you differ in your top five. Where do you kick things off? Yeah, again, I, I keep overrunning the bases. I did mention already that Alvarez was my number five outfielder. And please draft this guy in the first round if you can and get his teammate Kyle Tucker. Remember, when they did the Ted Williams documentary, they needed a stand-in for Ted Williams' to swing. They went to Kyle Tucker. What's a better compliment than that? And the Houston lineup is so – I mean, maybe the, the eight and nine spots will be dead, but they'll go seven deep, and Tucker can go 30-30. He's a guy who could be an MVP candidate. Julio Rodriguez, he's going to be fun to draft, so you're going to have to elbow everybody out of the room. Why did he not steal at the second half of last year? Was he dinged up a little bit? Does he see that maybe his game should be more about staying on the field, the home runs and everything? But what an exciting player. And I think Seattle was really smart to lock him up for the long term. He's their signature guy for the next decade. Ronald Acuna, again, a guy who could be on the magazine 
magazine covers next year. He was hurt last year. Atlanta's defense is very deep. And Acuna's made it clear, I want to be a 40-40 guy. I want to steal bases. I want to, you know, be the best, the most, the most dynamic stat grabber in the league. So I have him ranked two. Some people may have him ranked one. But Aaron Judge, after last season, he stays in New York. He's going to dominate four categories. So you say he doesn't run, so what? I, we're going to find stolen bases a lot easier this year. So but Judge doesn't fill out that category. It doesn't matter to me. And I love him in New York because you know what? This guy, he can hit him out of Yellowstone, but he can also like miss a pitch, hit it to the opposite field, and it still winds up in the seats. Yep. That wraps up another episode of Circling the Bases, the outfielder positional preview of Beast. And these guys absolutely crushed it with their rankings. So that being said, if you don't want to miss any of our positional previews, just subscribe to the podcast feed or you can watch right here on YouTube to catch everything with the Circling the Bases podcast. I'm Connor Rogers alongside DJ Short, Scott Pianowski. We'll talk to you soon.